Now this chapter should really be called Battle of the Waifus because that's exactly what we got in this chapter. But before that happened, we got some really interesting stuff with the leader of Redestro as well as Giran because we learned that Giran is trying to really use the Nomu card on uh, the leader of Redestro. I don't remember his name, but the Joker basically. And the Joker kind of like sees through his act because, you know, as you would think, people like this. They've done their research, especially when they threaten to attack the League of Villains right like when they invite the league of villains to their turf they're obviously gonna have to done some research on what kind of arsenal of people they have you know if they have any sort of armies lying around like the gnomus in this instance and yeah we see how he's actually very much aware of the kind of gnomus that they have and what they're willing to use so as he's saying while the gnomu is a strong asset it's not really enough to take on this much people especially given how their high-end one doesn't really seem like the type you'd have like mass produced instead it's more of a short supply of them and even if they can spawn smaller gnomu like the high end that we first saw the hood did those gnomu spawns don't really have the same constitution or power as your average gnomu which means that obviously it's not really that big of a threat to the joker and his team now what i really found to be really interesting here is he doesn't really know about giganto machia he doesn't really know about all for ones the doctor anything like that he only knows about the gnomu and the members that are part of the Shigaraki's team because let's be honest he has the information on the people that Giren recruited to Shigaraki which was obviously the people that are currently there right now apart from Kurogiri who is obviously in prison along with All for One. Now what's particularly interesting to me is that he doesn't know about anything that's above Shigaraki because as we know Shigaraki does plan on using Gaganto Machia in this arc he said so himself like whenever Gaganto Machia wakes up he is going to be heading for Shigaraki who happens to be in this town and when that happens the quirk liberation army is going to be very surprised like they're going to be met by a surprise that they probably cannot handle and if they can they're going to be a huge amount of casualties before gaganta machia bites the dust now i don't think gaganta machia is going to die by any means i think he's way too strong to be taken out by these kind of people but i definitely think he could be taking some big damage over a long period of time but there's a very good chance that the quirk liberation army is going to retreat because of how powerful Giganta Machia is whenever that happens. So I definitely don't see the Quirk Liberation Army being prepared for a threat on that scale because he is on a completely different level from any kind of Nomu, including the Nomus that we have seen, like the high-end ones, probably even the one that fought All Might because as far as I know, that wasn't even a high-end Nomu. It was just a normal Nomu that was engineered to combat All Might. You know, it had a lot of power and shock absorption, that kind of stuff, but it wasn't really considered a high end it didn't really have that many features it wasn't that well developed when you look deeper into it but Gagantomache is not even a gnome he's just I don't even know what he is he's just a massive kind of being with a lot of power behind him as far as we know he can take chunks out of mountains because we did see that but he's with his encounter with Gran Torino you know we saw how that mountain and forest was just completely obliterated when Gagantomache was finished and against Shigaraki we saw how he was obviously creating these sort of earthquakes by smashing the ground so we can probably assume it's something along those lines and that kind of damage is going to be very destructive within a town so I'm, I'm i'm really expecting the league of villains to have the upper hand whenever gaganta machia comes around but we don't really know how long it's gonna be and what's gonna happen before he actually arrives now let's get on to the big topic in this chapter which was obviously the battle of the waifus as i would like to say because it really does show us two great waifus fighting it out you know obviously there's a lot of talking as well but you get a general picture and obviously the fight is going to continue next chapter as well so it's not over by any means so we have Kizuki which is the member on the Quirk Liberation Army side the one that is in charge of Suesha in this series which yeah, she, you know she publishes the Superpower Liberation War Book which is obviously kind of centered around Destro's ideals and she is one of the so-called commanders of the leader of Redestro you know this the son of Destro. I don't think these commanders really have a official title. They're just kind of like doing their own thing. They're all kind of like the boss of some big corporation rather than actually having a common title. And last week I mentioned her quirk being something to do with explosives which was obviously 
right anything she touches turns into a detonator basically and it's called mine so obviously she can touch someone so i guess theoretically if she taps them on the shoulder their shoulder can become a bomb if she wants to detonate that and what i found really interesting about this power now this may annoy some people i don't think it will but just bear with me this power really reminds me of the power that Jackal has in Fairy Tale because he had a curse power which effectively caused him to have the exact same effect. Like if he touched someone, that part of their body turned into a bomb effectively and it would blow up. Now I don't really know if they mechanically work the same way. Like Kizuki seems to be able to detonate them at will. I'm not, I don't really remember if Jackal could do that. So I just found it really interesting how it was a very similar power to what I've actually seen in another series. Now I'm not saying it's a ripoff or anything. Don't like, you don't have to worry about that. Like I don't see a problem in having similar power from different series like you have you see that all the time right so no big deal i just thought i'd kind of mention that because it's the first thing i really thought of when i read the explanation of her quirk and we do see how this quirk is being very much utilized throughout the chapter like she destroys all kinds of stuff like she detonates the ground sometimes she can detonate people and we even see her detonating toga's blood which i found to be very interesting and the reason why that happened was obviously because Toga had taken blood from the other people and she had apparently turned them into bombs, right? So which kind of caused her to blow up through her sucking their blood, which was actually very unexpected in my opinion. Like I did not see that coming at all because it's just something that you wouldn't really expect. Like you wouldn't expect something to go that deep when it comes to a quirk that you could actually like put a detonator in their blood and whenever she sucks up the blood, you know, in turn, that makes her the bomb indirectly. Now, as we kind of like got teased last week we got some really interesting sort of backstory well it wasn't really much backstory we got a little background check on toga which i've been wanting for a very long time including her age we now have a confirmation toga is 17 years old she's not actually 20 plus so you don't have to worry guys now what i found really interesting though about her background is that it said that she is the oldest daughter of the toga family which kind of implies or let's be honest it kind of confirms that she has at least one younger sister and and obviously her parents too. And it seems like her parents or her family in general was kind of given some backlash whenever Toga disappeared because she disappeared after her graduation in middle school. And from Gizugi's explanation, it looks like the media was all over her family, which kind of implies that they may have blamed her parents for her disappearance. Like maybe they were accused of raising her badly or anything along those lines. I don't really know. So, you know, her family could have gone through some real hardships because of Toga's disappearance. And even now we don't really know what caused toga to disappear we only know when she disappeared how old she is and what she's like right now the the why factor has yet to be explained and i'm really waiting for that i think it's gonna happen next chapter the chapter after like i don't see why we wouldn't get that it's been teased now since last week so i mean it's about time toga why are you such a psycho <laughs> now there are two things that i want to mention in terms of her background but i really want to talk about these sort of images we saw from her past which was really interesting we see these male who look looks exactly like Deku. Now this is really explaining to us exactly why she has such a liking towards Deku because I'm guessing this guy is someone that she liked in her past and seeing Deku kind of reminds her of that person. So she's obviously pretending in her own mind I guess or whatever you want to call it that Deku is this person that she used to like. Now we don't really know if she's liked him because of how he looked or if it was something to do with his person but we do see how this guy is kind of a fighter like he does seem a bit roughed up and you know ready to fight something so i'm guessing he has a very different personality to deku but at the same time they're both prone to being roughened up quite a bit because we definitely see that with this person and we see it with deku all the time you know so it's very clear why toga homed in on deku over anyone else because they both look the same and they both end up really scruffed up you know just bloody and beaten probably now the, the last thing that i want to talk about in this review is actually a theory which is that toga and kami may have been classmates or friends back before Toga disappeared. Now, before a lot of people jump on me, I, I, let me explain exactly how this works. So, as we remember from the Provisional Hero License exam, Kami was ambushed by Toga and Toga disguised herself as Kami. This is not news to anyone. Everyone knows this. But what's really interesting about that is that Toga actually spared Kami, whereas in the past she hasn't really been shown to spare anyone that we know at least apart from Rocklock, which wasn't really a planned thing. Like, she was actually interrupted. She was probably gonna kill him 
had the chance presented itself, but it didn't because I believe Deku and Aizawa kind of got in the way. But with Kami, there wasn't really anyone that we know that could have gotten in the way because Kami was found later on, drugged up and stuff like that, which kind of implies that Toga had her way with her. Like she could have killed Kami if she wanted to, but she didn't do so. And they're the ex exact same age, by the way. Like now that we know that Toga is 17 years old, which Kami is as well. They're both 17 years old and they may as well have gone to the same school in the past. Like we don't know if they did, but they could have done back in middle school and she may have recognized Kami and obviously she used Kami as to get to Deku because she wanted to participate in order to get close to Deku because she was bored or whatever. Now it's not really you know a mind-blowing theory in that sense but it's just something that I really wanted to mention in this review because it kind of makes me think about that especially given how we don't really know why Toga spared Kami in the first place right like there, that is something that's been a mystery for a very long time now like we know she did spare Kami because Kami is in fact alive but we don't know why there's absolutely no information like hard confirmed information on why she did that like it could have been a mistake like with lock rock or whatever you know it doesn't have to have been but it could definitely have been i don't think it was if i'm being honest like i definitely think there's a connection there i don't think there's a strong connection just a connection anyway gonna end the review here so let me know what you think down below in the comments what you thought about this chapter was it good was it bad you know do you love toga now do you, did you always like toga because if you don't like toga well you're wrong. And as always, if you did, be sure to Detroit smash that like button if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't done so already. This has been Chaotic Plus and remember, Toga is waifu, Toga is life.